You know, it's been a long time since I was there, but it's dark in the womb, at least so I've been told. <laughs> and, and so in darkness, we're all born, and yet most of us seem to spend the rest of our lives trying to avoid the dark. We seek out the light, and we banish the darkness to the closets and the cellars of our emotional and our physical life. I'm in a dark space right now, we might tell a friend, or if, if we're feeling kind of low, kind of in a dark place. Um, I wouldn't want to meet up with him in a dark alley, conveys a threat and not a promise. We fear the darkness for those unseen things that go bump. We fear the darkness for what it hides from our sight. And yet when we turn out the lights, when we turn out the lights, um, something wonderful happens. We can often see things that we haven't seen before. Look around you as your eyes get used to the darkness. And as they adjust, what can you see that you didn't see before? Maybe you see the glow from the door over here. Um, I'm really quite impressed. I was expecting that I'd see the glow of a few uh, cell phones in the audience, but I don't see nary a one. And the magical thing is, the longer we stay here in the dark, the more our eyes adapt, and the more that we can see. And the really neat thing is that when we go outside into the wilderness, and um, we, let, we, we, we uh, go out on a clear moonless night, something similar happens in the dark, except for much more wonderful. Unfortunately for most of us, uh, we, we really don't get views that are that spectacular. Satellite surveys of the night sky indicate that about 80% of the people living in the United States can't see the Milky Way at night from where they live. Light pollution has stolen the night from us and made it impossible to see those faint objects that once were a part of everyone's experience. And it doesn't take very much light. Drive 40 miles from the Tri-Cities, you will still see the glow of the Tri-Cities on the horizon. But let's imagine for a moment that we could go out into the wheat fields and on a clear moonless night, what would we see out there? Well, the first thing we might notice is that we see a lot more stars than we imagined there were. When I take my dog Maddie out for our nightly walk, just a couple blocks from this theater, we're in town, and, and I might see perhaps two dozen stars on a moonless night. If I've been looking at my cell phone, then I'll probably see a couple fewer. If I'm standing in the shadows of a maple tree or, or a sycamore under, and, and away from the street light, I might see a couple dozen more. If I go out into the suburbs, away from the city lights, away from commercial buildings and stoplights and, and street lights, I might see perhaps 200 stars in the night sky. If I go out into the wheat fields, 40 miles from town, away from almost all lights, on a clear moonless night, I can see as many as 4,500 stars. These are what astronomers call uh, the local neighborhood, a term that only astronomers could get away with using for stars that are still tens to thousands of light years away. That means the light that left those stars isn't, isn't what, what we're seeing isn't the light that left those stars right now. That's the light that left years and years ago. In the case of our sun, that was eight and a half minutes ago. In the case of the bright star Sirius, which is the dog star, the brightest star we can see in the, in the sky, uh, that light left eight and a half years ago, about the time of the first TED Talk, actually. And if we look at the star Deneb in the constellation the Swan, that light left 1,700 years ago, when Attila the Hun was still roaming around Asia. But what if we let our eyes adapt even further? How far can we see? Well, if you are out on a summer night in particular, and you look up to the sky after your eyes have adapted, you'll see the Milky Way. 
Milky Way is this river of light that crosses the sky roughly north to south. And the neat thing about looking at the Milky Way is that we're looking at the edge of our universe. We're looking sort of edge on right through our universe. We're seeing not tens of stars, not hundreds of stars, not even millions of stars, but hundreds of billions of stars. And we're looking very far back in time. In fact, when we look to the southern part of the Milky Way, the bright part of the Milky Way in the summertime, we're seeing light uh, that that left over 20,000 years ago. Think about that. When the light that this picture was taken with first left the, the stars that it originated from, this theater and everyone in it would have been under tw- uh, about 600 feet of water because it would have been during the Ice Age floods. But let's keep watching for a while. What else do we see? Well, eventually, we're going to see some shooting stars. We'll see them streak across the sky, and every one of them is a fiery reminder that Joni Mitchell was right when she said that we are stardust, we are golden. Because these are the ashes of dead stars falling to Earth to become part of our living planet. Let's look up to the north part of the sky. If you look to the north, and if you're lucky enough, and if if you're patient enough, and it's dark enough, you may just see a a faint green fog along the horizon. You may even imagine that you see it moving. But that's not your imagination. Those are the northern lights. And believe it or not, even down here at 47 degrees latitude, we still get the northern lights several times a year. Well, what does all this matter? Well, I suppose I could tell you that this is important because being able to see the night sky will inspire our kids to want to be part of these STEM careers that are so vaunted. It'll spark their love of science, and they'll want to all grow up to be scientists. But, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson grew up in Brooklyn. He could see maybe a dozen stars at night at best. And he seems to have done pretty well. So I could tell you instead that, you know, the the universe and the stars, the night sky has inspired artists from the ancients through Van Gogh to Paul Simon and, and, and even contemporary artists. And I wouldn't be lying if I said that, but I don't think it's the most important thing. And it's certainly not the only thing. I could tell you instead that you have to experience it. If you lay out on a blanket at night in the summer, that sense of awe is what's important. That's why it's important. But if you've done that, you already understand that. And if you haven't, you probably can't be convinced. So I'm going to suggest instead that what's important about the night sky and our ability to see it is all of these things and more. I'm going to suggest that the night sky, instead, is is a thread that links us across cultures and across the ages, because it's the one thing that hasn't changed about our human experience. It's a thread that weaves throughout the the entire fabric of what it means to be human. You know, it's not like the night sky doesn't change, ever. Um, But it changes very slowly across the the millennia. Uh, Supernova here, uh, slow drifting apart of stars over there. But for the most part, things stay pretty constant up in space. In fact, if we were to uh, be standing here with Kennewick Man and walk him down to the river, he probably wouldn't recognize the river, not after 6,000 years. I think the Columbia's changed a bit since his time. He could look up into the hills and he would be totally confused by all these buildings and man-made structures up there. And he'd certainly be aghast, I think, at the roar of cars and airplanes flying past in every direction. But we could take him out into the night sky and have him look up and he'd take comfort in seeing the arc of the Milky Way. He could foretell the coming of the winter from the three bright stars of Orion's belt, although he'd know it by a different name, he would know those stars, and he would know that that means, when he sees that in the early morning hours, that winter is coming. Even before the first frost, those stars tell what's happening. He would foresee his fate 
and ours written in the stars. So what can we do about it? Well, these talks are supposed to be about big ideas. And so here's mine. I want to propose that we have a unique opportunity here in our community, something that very, community, very few communities have, in fact. And that is the opportunity to take back some of the night sky. Um, these are pictures of the Hanford Reservation at night. The first couple were pictures looking south towards Rattlesnake Mountain from the highway. As you notice, the mountain has no lights on it from the highway all the way to the top of the mountain. Looking north, the view is not quite as, as rosy. Um, we see lights spreading from the end reactor to the north to the Tri-Cities off to the east. And these islands of light basically obscure the, the night sky all along the horizon. Looking further beyond Hanford, though, we see very few lights between the river and the town of Othello, just a few scattered farms. So we have a stretch of about 35 miles from north to south. And yes, right now they're obscured by lights from the construction projects and the, and the cleanup projects. But what if we were to set about deciding that we were going to clean up not only the soil and the water at Hanford, but the night sky as well? Call me naive or, or call me an optimist. I like to prefer an optimist. Uh, but I think at some point that cleanup project will be done and the need for those lights will slowly fade away. What if we could bring back that, that ability to go out into the Hanford site and see the night sky in its richness. It can be done. Um, communities all around the United States have, especially here in the West, where, where it's not too late, have elected to try to save some of the night sky. There's an organization called the International Dark Sky Association that actually has put together a model ordinance that helps to protect both personal property and personal safety while still preserving the night by minimizing the amount of light that spills over from lighting fixtures and homes and businesses. Communities like uh, Malibu, California, and Sedona, Arizona, and Moab, Utah, have all adopted these standards and found ways to preserve the night sky. In fact, what they've found is that it actually increases the amount of time that tourists spend in their communities. We already know that people come to the Tri-Cities for our abundant sunshine. What if we could offer them starlight as well? That would be pretty cool. So if you share that vision, if you believe that's something that's worthwhile, I encourage you to do at least one thing tonight, today, and that is to go to the Facebook page, In Defense of Darkness. Um, that's a site that we've set up specifically as a rallying point for people who believe, as I do, that the night sky ties us across time and across space to the rest of the universe and who want to try to find a way to preserve that. We have a choice. We, we can preserve that darkness, we can reclaim the night for our children and for ourselves, or we can let it vanish into a bright glow. It's up to us. Thank you very much.